Albany Sheriff arrived at the farm with a posse of over 200 armed men. Vermont wasn't attracting people that much because we didn't have that kind of wildness. If we're going to talk about community base, sustainability, you know, private enterprise that I think is really going to set the debate and the agenda in the future. If state decisions are based solely on state constitutional law, there's no federal review of that. Our speaker this evening is Professor Susan Ouellet, uh, Chair of the Department of History at St. Michael's College. Uh, her PhD is from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Her teaching encompasses uh, early America, includes, includes courses such as Women in American Society, Native Peoples of North America, and the History of the American Family. An enthusiasm for local history has involved her in uncovering fragments from the lives of several area women. The uh, Domestication of Betsy Ketchum is the title of one of her articles. Uh, Jane Maycumber Parkhill is explored in another article called The Perils of the Park Hills, uh, Marriage, Sexuality, and the Gospel of Love, and the manuscript diary of Phoebe Orvis Eastman uh, performs Professor Willett's current research focus, and I think that's what she's talking about tonight. It's right here in front of me, yes. Uh, in, uh, and she's published several essays in Vermont history uh, and in uh, other historical venues. She's presented a number of places in Vermont, New York, neighbor, our neighboring states, uh, in Quebec, as well as at national conferences and on Vermont public radio. Uh, her interest in hand weaving has developed from dissertation into book with U.S. textile production in historical perspective, a case study from Massachusetts, uh, published by Routledge in 2006. So please joining, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Susan Willat. Thank you. Uh, that was really fulsome. <laughs> Um, I am here to talk tonight about my um, Phoebe Orvis, my diarist, who um, sometimes I feel like she's following me around, poking me every now and then when I stray away from the project. So it's always a, a pleasure for me to um, talk about her, and I'm hoping that what I have to say tonight, um, you'll be able to help direct me in ideas about how I should move forward in handling what I consider to be this really valuable women's history resource. Phoebe Orvis was a nobody. She didn't found a school. She was not a missionary. She didn't exchange letters with an American president. She was not a suffragette. She was not a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She wasn't a published author. She was just an ordinary woman. We don't even know what she looked like. As far as I know, there are no extant photographs of her, although I did find a memorial portrait of her older brother online. It was taken after he died. It was quite gruesome, and I'm quite glad I didn't find one of Phoebe. Uh, I don't think that would have been a nice thing to see. Um, so why should we care about this woman who was a nobody, who lived and died more than a century and a quarter ago? This was actually the question that an editor for a press asked me when I sent a prospectus to him um, promoting this diary as a project. And um, frankly, he just said to me, why would we want to publish something about a nobody? And after I got over the first flush of serious anger about him dismissing my diarist and my project so out of hand, I thought of this as a, um, actually an exercise in how I would explain to someone why this is important. And once I put my mind to it, I really didn't have to think a lot about what my answer really needed to be. It's her commonplace life that makes Phoebe so interesting. 
We know a lot about Abigail Adams, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and other notable women, especially those whose elite status virtually guaranteed the preservation of their papers and, and letters and ephemera. But how much do we really know about the internal lives of women like Phoebe Orvis? In most cases, they left no personal writings, often only very, very tiny bits of tangible evidence of their very existence, often just a stone in a cemetery, sometimes not even that. The rest, and this is more broadly construed, we can only reconstruct from the public records that are available to us through the lens of male-oriented documents like the census, court records, mortgages, deeds, and so on. What we do know is often generalized and very more often very sterile. Most often we can only produce vague portraits of generalized ordinary people with estimates of family size, life expectancy, household incomes, things like that. I don't mean to disregard this kind of work. These studies have been painstakingly extracted from all of those sources by by historians who have worked really hard, and I'm clearly in awe of their work. They don't call it dirty fingernail work for nothing. It's often literally that. This is what sets the Orvis Journal apart. Between 1820 and 1830, Phoebe Orvis wrote an entry in her diary nearly every single day. It's a mixed bag. It's a record of her work, a list of her accomplishments, it's her reading list. It was a secret place to express her fears. Sometimes, though, she didn't even dare express those fears, and sometimes it's those absences that are even more interesting. The priceless legacy of this diary is that it's a tiny little window opening on the past where we can get these glimpses of what this particular woman's life was and by association, of course, what the life of many women like her would have been. The survival of the journal itself is a miracle. It's small, unexception unexceptional. Um, it's a, a, actually, I recently saw one nearly identical at Rugby Museum, but it's a, a paper that was stitched folded and then with cardboard covers. And she wrote over every available tiny little space and tiny little writing. Um, so it's not anything beautiful to look at necessarily unless you really love tiny little writing. <laughs> um, in the 1960s, an antique book dealer bought a box of books at an auction in Plattsburgh, New York, and this was in the bottom of the box. He pulled it out thought it was terribly uninteresting, passed it on to a friend of his who um, was a historian in Canton, New York. It was quite by accident that it went from uh, Canton to Plattsburgh and then back to Canton again. Um, and Mary Smallman, the woman that he gave this book to, hung on to it for 40 years and dipped into it read it, um, thought about it, did a little bit of research locally about it, but basically just hung on to it, put it in a box with a bunch of other things. Eventually, when she started thinking about what to do with her collection, she donated it to the St. Lawrence Historical Society, but not before she made a painstaking transcript of it, which she then hung on to for another five or six years before I met her, and in a, I think, exceptional, um, moment of generosity, she basically gave it to me. And that's how I came into contact with it. So it was a, a real miracle that I ever even got to know about this, this piece. Secondly, um, the other interesting coincidence is that um, I came to Vermont just the year before I was handed this treasure. and. My husband and I bought a house and lived on a road that she would have traveled. And when we started to go to a local church, it turned out that this tiny little Catholic church was actually um, in, uh, being 
had been consecrated from the original Quaker meeting house where Phoebe would have gone to meeting all those years ago when she lived in Starksboro. So all these connections seem to make it my duty to make some sense out of this. Well, the night that I was past this manuscript, I sat down and read through it, and I found that this was a, a priceless gift. I couldn't put it down. I literally read through the whole thing, although I have to say that the, about halfway through, and of course, all of the, the um, people that were mentioned in the diary meant nothing to me, so I'm reading all of these names. It's sort of like, I think Laura Ulrich made this comment in The Midwife's Tale that it's kind, when you open a diary like this, it's kind of like walking into a room full of strangers. It is very much like that. You see all of these names, and it doesn't make a lot of sense, but there was enough there that I could get a sense of her um, life and I was absolutely astounded when I turned the page and read that she was getting married. And the day she got married, now nothing coming up to this entry gave any clue that she was contemplating marriage, let alone that she'd accepted someone. And the marriage, it's burned into my brain. I can repeat it almost verbatim. Um, but basically this entry said something to the effect of beautiful. The first word of every entry is the weather beautiful. What a dreadful day this is. And then she goes on to describe her wedding. And I was so shocked that first of all she would think her wedding, was, wedding day was dreadful and that she had not indicated in the diary that she was getting married just completely grabbed me. And so I went back to the first day and started reading it again forward looking for tiny little clues. And I in the second reading, I began to see some of these clues. I also learned that using this kind of material is, it's like mining for gold nuggets, or maybe panning for gold. I've never done either one of those things, but I can imagine that that's what it's like. You fill your pan up with the soil and you swirl the water around, and when you're done, maybe after four or five pails, you might have a tiny little flake of gold, and that's, kind of what happens with these documents is you get these little flecks of gold and you keep putting them together and putting them together and you do a little research and you put a little more together and suddenly you have this little pile of gold dust and it's really valuable. And that's what I think this um, really is, is this valuable little set of gold, um, not nuggets, but even just little tiny flakes. Now, Phoebe began her um, journal in July of 1820. She was 19, she was single, and I learned as I read along, she was preparing to attend Emma Willard's Middlebury um, Female Seminary. Now, she was actually going this fall after Emma Willard herself had left Millard um, Middlebury and gone to Waterford, New York. But her school persisted for some time after she left Middlebury and so um, even though Phoebe would, was not taught by Emma Willard herself, she was taught in the style and with the philosophy that Emma Willard had. So right away, there, here's the story of a woman who experienced female higher education in the very first generation that it was happening. And she wrote a bit about it. Here are her thoughts of the first day of school. Attended the ladies quarterly. Taught by Miss Lucy Burnap. Enjoyed very disagreeable feelings from various courses. First, on account of my being an entire stranger to most of the other ladies, and they to me. Second, being entirely unacquainted with the manner and customs of the school. Third, not having attended any kind of school for some years, which of course rendered me more ignorant than others of the school. In parentheses she wrote, these reflections, I conclude, are the effects of injured pride, unquote, or, un or close parentheses. 
However, I'm extremely pleased with Ms. Burnap. Her dress is plain, her manner easy and agreeable, and she excels on piety, which renders her exemplary and amiable. The school commences by reading two verses of scripture. Miss B makes an introductory prayer next to writing in geography, a lesson in Cummings geography, in fact, parsing English grammar in the afternoon, rhetoric, logic, philosophy, history, other studies, have singing instead of reading before prayer in the evening. And that's the end of the entry. Well, when I read this, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, aside from her mention of piety and the prayer, any woman going to college in the last 200 years would have said almost the same thing. Are my clothes right? Am I smart enough? Am I going to make friends? You know, how am I gonna make my way in this new environment? And I thought, wow, you know, this is very modern in context on the one hand, and yet yeah, this is the person, this is the generation that uh, this woman is the first generation of it that's experiencing this. So I got very excited. So that was the first story that I mined out of this diary. And so I started to look really closely at all sorts of things like um, newspaper ads for Emma Willard's school, the, uh, what she was, um, and Lucy Burnap, was advertising that students would learn, how much it costs to go there, um, and so on. And so I started again with the beginning of the diary and started to look, how did, how did Phoebe pay for this? And I realized that what happened was she um, worked really hard for her grandparents. She was actually living with her grandparents in Bristol because her mother uh, died when she was born, and so her grandparents had raised her. And her grandparents weren't paying for the school. She was paying for the school. And she was, the money she was earning to go to school was money that she, um, was, was for work that she did right alongside of all the other work that she did. And so the other thing that goes on in this diary is the enormous productive capabilities of these women across all sorts of different kinds of skills. Not just the baking and the brewing, but the textile skills. She was, uh, for instance, she was doing outwork, making shirts for a local merchant. Um, she was also spinning um, for both herself, her grandmother, for neighbors. She was weaving uh, uh, the list of the kinds of work that she did was endless. She also went into neighbors' homes and helped take care of the sick. Um, I, I was amazed, absolutely floored, at the, the amount of work that she was doing. And in exchange for some of this work, not all, but some of this work, she got paid. And that money is what she used to pay for her board in Middlebury as she went to school. And for her books and whatever else that she needed to go to school. And so as I went back through the diary again for the fourth, the fifth, and I don't know how many times I've read it now, um, I, each time I would pick out some of the clues to how this woman was accomplishing this. I don't really know what her grandparents thought about her going to school. They obviously didn't forbid it because she was allowed to go but they didn't pay for it, so I'm not really sure what that means. I do know that at one point she came home and um, had been asked by a family member to come to their home and do more work, and she thought she could earn more money and uh, presumably maybe uh, be able to stay longer at school. And her grandmother basically told her no, that she wasn't going to be allowed to do that. And in fact, if she went to live and work at this um, uncle's home, that she would, she would not be welcome to come back again. Um, her grandmother, I suspect from s just the little bits and pieces that are um, represented in the diary, was quite the um, sharpish lady um, and told it like it was. Every time she and Phoebe had a disagreement, it was quite clear that grandmam won and laid down the law, and then Phoebe lived with it. But I, I also know from other things that she wrote that she loved her grandparents deeply and honored them. And so I don't think this was an unhappy household at all. I also know that her Uncle John, her uh, father's, I'm sorry, her mother's brother, and his wife lived in the household too. And so at times 
uh, Phoebe and her sister, her, I'm sorry, her aunt-in-law, um, Lavina, worked together in the house. So there was all sorts of activities that went on, very, very interesting family activities that can be uh, followed out. Another area that I got interested in was the constant visiting that went on. The mobility um, of Phoebe and her friends and family is astounding. They were constantly shuttling from each other's homes, spending the night and um, going to all of these different kinds of events. Phoebe regularly attended, she lived in Bristol, she attended 4th of July in Virgins. Apparently that was the place to celebrate 4th of July in the 1820s, early 1820s. And um, they always stopped off on the way home at General Dunton's house because apparently he put on a big meal and had a kind of after celebration party. Um, another event that she never missed was the um, Middlebury commencement. She cherished that, wrote down some of the lectures that she heard and always recorded the people that orated at these um, different exercises. And so she was traveling to Middlebury. She didn't just go to commencement when she was living in Middlebury. She went to commencement before she went to Middlebury. No doubt she learned about Emma Willard's school by going to Middlebury to the, the commencement. She also engaged in a whole variety of, you know, what I guess, at least from the way in which they get presented in the diary, regular young people's activities, frolics, dances, she talks about, or writes about rather, I hear her voice in my head sometimes, so uh, it's, I, I'll slip back and forth and use the wrong language, but she writes about coming in at midnight, coming in at, um, long after midnight, and again, you know, it's not something you really think about in 1820 that young girls are going out with promiscuous groups of men and women together to these frolics, and um, staying out really late. And they're always, always, it seems to me, courting and mixing and matching and checking each other out. It, it was just amazing to me how much of that was really clear to see in the diary. Um, an example of this kind of, of activity. Um, attended meeting at New Haven Mills. Walked to Mr. Handy's at noon. Mr. Handy was one of the men that she sewed shirts for. Um, rode home with Miss Sylvina Hanchett, took tea. Was introduced to Mr. Phelps and Calvin Butler. Received a pressing invitation to go to Mr. Harris's. Rode home from Mr. Barry's with Miss Ennen, Mr. Drake, and Mr. Austin. Went to the Springs. Saw, Ms. saw Dr. Giles, called at Mr. Pettibone's to see Miss Elmira, found her very sick, introduced to Mr. Elijah Smith of Moncton, returned home very late. This was all in a single day. She talks about walking out. There are often um, opportunities for herself and, and several of her friends to then meet up with young men and, and walk out together. And they would couple up. But if, and this is something that was fascinating to me, if the young woman was no longer interested with the young man, uh, in the young man as a partner, um, she would, and Phoebe writes this more than a half a dozen times in the, in the, in the uh, diary, she would give him his dismission. So this young man really liked her a lot, and he kept coming around. His name was Sprague. For a while, I was really excited. I thought maybe he was related to the um, um, Axa Sprague, who became the famous spiritualist. But it turned out if they're related, they're distant cousins. But um, I thought Phoebe had just missed marrying someone who'd produced this famous mystic. But at any rate, um, Alva Sprague was crazy about her and kept coming around and coming around and coming around. And she'd receive him, and they'd take walks together, take you know, go for a ride together, and so on. 
But finally, she was just downright tired of him. And she, one evening, he came by and she gave him his dismission. And that was it. Elvis Bragg didn't come back to visit her anymore. He did, he traveled with the crowd, but he never came back to her home to, to court her, which is, uh, I think, um, a fascinating world that we're getting a look at. Now, there's, there are happy stories, and, then, and, there, and there are also very sad stories in, in the diary as well. Um, one of the um, sadder stories, although somewhat romantic, um, is the story of Phoebe Orvis's first love. At the very beginning of the diary, she writes a lot about um, her best friend, Ora Copeland. Her and Ora Copeland travel together a lot, and there are a number of young men who often accompany them. Uh, one of them was a guy named Adolphus Taylor. Adolphus Taylor was apparently a Middlebury College student who was also employed as a teacher locally. And although she wasn't ex expressly clear about this in the diary at first, it seemed that Phoebe had fallen in love with Adolphus Taylor. And so it took a while. He was, he was actually courting her best friend, Aura, but eventually he became interested in her. And when she went to school in Middlebury, much to her great joy, he started visiting her specifically. And eventually, they fell in love, I, I guess would be the best way to describe it. He gave her his pocket watch. She gave him a hair ring. They exchanged monogrammed uh, handkerchiefs. That's as good as it gets for the time. Um, now, the next part of the story, I, I don't really know all the particulars. So I can only guess by the absences in the diary. Um, suddenly, her family informs her she can't go back to school. She's in a break, in a school break at that point. And she's told she can't go back to school. And her aunt is coming from Canton, New York. And she has to go with her aunt back to Canton. And she doesn't want to go, but she can't refuse, so she does. And I think what happened is that the family did not want her to marry Adolphus Taylor. And so they got her out of Bristol and 100 plus miles away. Didn't work though, because about three months after she was in Canton, Adolphus showed up on her doorstep. He'd gotten a teaching job in Madrid, which is a small town close by. So she was happy again. She was devastated, now she's happy. So it looked like the lovers were, were now going, I don't mean specifically, you know, explicitly lovers, but the, the two people who are in love, um, are able then to go ahead and continue their courtship. Except, again, something happens. And I don't think Phoebe really knows what it is, because she doesn't write about it at all. But suddenly, one morning, he shows up. He gives her back her things. She gives him back his things. She cries in secret for a couple of days, and he goes off back to Bristol and marries her best friend. Well, she was devastated by that, but she was a woman who was able to get beyond that, and she didn't give up her best friend, even though her best friend married the guy she really loved. Um, and they continued to correspond, even though now Miss Ora Copeland was Mrs. Adolphus Taylor, she even writes that in her diary. How hard that must have been to write. Um, there are lots and lots of other stories. The struggles with her husband over his irreligious behavior. Eventually, he gets revived by the, a second great awakening revival that comes to their, their town and decides he, he, he becomes, I think, a Baptist. She's horrified by that because she thinks of herself as a Quaker, doesn't like the whole notion of baptism. Um, there's a secret plot to forcibly baptize her. She's able to escape it. Um, she proceeds to, uh, um, eventually, they have children, um, about one every other year, starting the second year of their marriage. Um, and after her fifth child is born, she stops writing. 
I don't think it's a surprise. She goes on having children. I know from those records I was talking about earlier that she had 11 children totally, that 10 of them lived to be adults. Um, so she had a very large family. Um, she um, lived only a year after her husband. They're both buried together in the Baptist Cemetery in Parishville, which I don't think means that she became a Baptist. I think, I was told that the Baptists would have welcomed his spouse, so it may be that she retained her faith in, in her religious tradition. I, I'm not sure. That's something I'm still working on. Um, but at any rate, so I've told you lots of stories that I've mined out of diet. There's tons more. Uh, but now the question is, what do I do with this? And so I'm going to just um, finish by saying that um, what I've been working on over the past couple of years is trying to find a way to publish the diary, but with enough material to contextualize it so that if someone picks it up, they can both read it for themselves, but also understand who all those people are and what all those, what the experience and what the background of all of those places are. And um, so that's the project that I'm engaged in now. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, but that's it. Yes? When Stacy stopped writing after the second child, did, was there more space left in the book, or so she actually stopped, it didn't just run out? Yes, um, her, there, there are a, many pages in the back of the book that are empty. Um, the other, there are all sorts of little mysteries though. She wrote, it looks like she might have intended to pick it up at some point because there are a couple of loose leaf sheets that she started writing things on that are kind of tucked into the back. Um, she also recorded many years later, um, the diary ends in 1830 when her oldest son is just eight years old and yet in the back of her diary she recorded his um, going off to housekeeping goods that she and her husband provided him, and the going off to housekeeping goods that they provided to their oldest daughter. So um, it, obviously she hung on to it for a very long time. Another really interesting thing that's in the diary, which um, I can't really say a lot about, but I was totally fascinated, is the last two pages of the diary are, co are columnized, and then they're covered with um, Chinese script with vowels and translations as if she was trying to teach herself Chinese. And so I, at first I, I, and it was, it's clearly her handwriting and I, I'm thinking, you know, how, how it could this be? And I um, talked about this actually with Nicholas Clifford who was able to tell me first that it was Mandarin and secondly that it had come from a particular book and when I looked very closely in the diary, I actually found the title of the book. And so she was reading about China, and I think she may actually have even been thinking about being a missionary, uh, but never even dared write that to herself in her diary. She just recorded the Chinese in the back as if this was such a secret desire she didn't dare express it in writing. Um, and that's all I can tell you about that. Other questions? After she show up in any merchant's records? Okay, well, first of all, after she was married, I think she was so busy producing for her family that she there's no evidence that she was doing that. Although it seems that she did weave, I think she and her neighbors, because they, one of the things I didn't really make clear, um, I apologize, you know, Canton, New York in this time is the frontier. It, the War of 1812 is really only over for less than a decade by the time she's there. And she's, she and her husband live along the military road and so there's a small sort of cadre of people living there. 
And I think that they may have been exchanging things. So someone was spinning, someone else was weaving. And so there was some of that neighborhood exchange going on. But I suspect that it's not so much for money as much as it is just to keep the children in what, what they needed. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of your question? Uh, merchants. Oh, merchants. When well, she's younger, why right? one when she shows up in any? Well, I, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to find are the mer since she names the merchants in her diary, I've been trying to track down if there's any records, and so far I have not been able to find any. But I just discovered that there's a huge cache of, of um, merchants' books in Albany, New York at the State Archives, and they're all from the um, Potsdam Parishville area. And, and I'm hoping that at least during the time she was living with her aunt and uncle before she married, that maybe she might show up then. Or it's possible after she's married, but before the children come along. But no, I haven't found that yet. But, I, but that's one of the pieces I would love to be able to, to plug in. Yes? Yeah, I guess she's saying it, but did you ever figure out why she said her wedding day was dreadful? I think because, and she doesn't say, but I think because she wasn't marrying the man she loved. She was marrying the man that her family approved of. Now, that's not to say that she didn't come to love him, but they were very different people. They spent, um, for the, the um, eight or seven or eight years of the diary that she's married to Samuel Eastman, they struggled a lot. He, the first few years, he's very irreligious, and he spends his Sabbaths fishing, hunting, drinking with his militia buddies, and she's horrified by it. And they have this struggle because she thinks that they should spend their Sundays reading the Bible and, and communing with God. And um, so one, one sort of event that I think kind of encapsulates that whole relationship is um, in August one year, I think it's the first year they're married, he caught this huge mess of fish and brought them home and expected her to cook them and she refused. And of course, in August, fish would spoil real very fast. And so the fish spoiled, and he was upset with her. But she held her ground and was not going to give in. And I really think that most of their marriage, they had that kind of you know, tension. Not that they fought a lot, but that they disagreed. And that each one of them was, was very um, sure in their convictions. And I think that. Um, certainly the disagreement over their religious sensibilities was part of that, that inherent tension in their marriage. And yet, they had 11 children. Yeah. So obviously she must have liked him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he was actually quite proud of his wife because he was always you know, bringing her things and taking her places and things like that. So, so in, as much as it was a sort of I hate to say contractual, but at least not a love marriage or a love match in the way that she would have felt her match with Adolphus was. Um, they clearly made a life together. Interesting. She's a Quaker, and he isn't, and her family approves of the marriage. If he's, he's not affiliated at all with any kind of well, see, this is. Do you know anything about the grandparents? Okay, I think the Eastmans were Quakers originally, but I think by the generation of of Samuel Eastman, they had um, become, or I don't know what the proper term disowned. would be. I'm sorry, disowned. Disowned, and so. Um, so although he wasn't a Quaker himself, he was of the old stock. Yeah. His family had been from Bristol, had been part of the early proprietary groups in Bristol. Um, the Brookses, who were Phoebe's maternal grandparents, the Orvises, her, her paternal, um, uh, her father and her paternal grandparents, um, they were all part of that migration of Quakers into Addison County. And so on the one hand, yes, he wasn't a Quaker, but he was part of that group. Mm -hmm. And I think more importantly, he had a 100-acre farm. And I think that compared to Adolphus, who was an itinerant teacher, 
um, yeah. he was a better choice. And I actually think it, the interesting thing is that when you look at the period that she's in Canton, when the Eastman, there are, there are three Eastman brothers, two of them courted her actively. And she couldn't abide Lee Eastman at all and was constantly writing about what a horrible man he was. Um, and I think Samuel was the lesser of two evils. <laughs> That's probably putting it too harshly. But, um, but clearly, he was the one that, that, given no other real alternatives, that she, but all through her diary until she gets married, over and over again, she writes that you know, every time one of her, her um, close friends gets married, she'd say, oh, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, thank God I'm not getting married, and things like that. And then all of a sudden, she's getting married. So it, it really says something about her feelings about the whole subject. She also alludes to having conversations with her friends about marriage and, and those conversations not being very happy, but she's never specific about what, exactly what they're saying to each other. Were her grandparents a meeting attenders when she was growing up? The Brooks were, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. She grew up att attending meetings. She, She's recorded in the Ferrisburg records when she's four. So, um, and that's about the time that her father remarried and moved to Ferrisburg, but she stayed in, in Bristol with her grandparents and, w and went to the Starksboro meeting, which I think was the closest meeting for them. I don't. I don't think they disapproved of it. I think they just simply um, did, perhaps didn't have the money to pay for it, although they seemed to be very, not well-to-do, but certainly comfortable. They were just um, impractical. They, they just didn't, I don't think they necessarily approved of any expanded education. They certainly didn't stop her from attending Sabbath schools. They didn't seem to have any, there was nev never anything in the diary that indicated they were negative about her reading, which she read constantly. She was always writing letters. She was you know, the life of her mind. And I really think that that was the attraction that Adolphus had for her. He was an intellectual, and that's what she really wanted was this life of the mind, which, of course, um, Samuel, I don't think Samuel even wrote. Um, I, I've seen a couple of documents where he just, you know, mark, signed with a mark. Although that doesn't necessarily mean he didn't write, but uh, he seemed to have less education. Um, but her own father signed with a mark, too, so um, I'm not really sure what that means, either. Yes? Did her own children go on for further education? You know, I don't know a lot about what happens to her children as they grow up. That's the part of the story that I haven't really had enough time to know much about. Um, I suspect that they did. Um, certainly, she was a school teacher herself for a while before her children were born, um, and actually in, in the interim before um, she marries. And she believed in the value of education. And in fact, at one point, you had an alter altercation with the, um, the, the uh, I guess, what would be the, the equivalent of the superintendent of schools out in um, Potsdam. He confiscated one of her books because he felt that it was too forward. Um, it dealt with kind of natural history, and he thought that that was something, you know, going for nature walks wasn't something that students should do. They should, reading, writing, arithmetic, that's that. And so he actually confiscated her book and sold it. She was very devastated when that happened. So, so I believe that, it, that they probably did. And certainly, um, they're her sons, if not her daughters. But I, I suspect her daughters at least would have had basic education. It's difficult to know what was available on the frontier at that point, too. Well, as I said, it's one of the things that strikes me about this is that, you know, listening to her story, it's something that you might, you, you would just accept if you're talking about, you know, Greater Boston or Greater Philadelphia, and that she'd get this education, that she'd be you know, this active. But it seems to me that the real context here is that this is a frontier experience. That's what really makes this. One of the, the interesting things to me is that it's a matter of um, it's a matter of perspective. When she goes out to Kim, she goes reluctantly. She writes about the fact that it feels like she's going to her own funeral as she's leaving home, and so clearly she's reluctant. Um, 
And when she writes about Bristol and Middlebury, she writes about it as if they are the pinnacle of civilization. And when you think about it, in 1822, the paint's barely dry on the boards there. You know, so it's not as if that is Boston. But yet, for, from her perspective, you know, it's this, this it, it is the, the world that she grows up in, obviously, but it's the pinnacle of civilization compared to this rude and rough and terrible uh, frontier place. And she missed home terribly all the time. Complained a lot about the fact that the, the rudeness and the crudeness of the people that she mostly had to deal with in, in um, the Perishable, in the context of Perishable, even her relatives. Yes? Well, I'm, the, part of the reason that I was asking about her grandparents is because of the, of the other friends in that area who went to Great Nine Partners, the boarding school in um, Dutchess County. Right. I mean, which was far more elaborate than going down to Middlebury. And there were, you know, Mary Rogers went, and Rowland, he was male, but there were a few from that area. Mm -hmm. And the friends had a much more, you know, liberal and progressive view about educating women. Um, I mean, Mary just came home and worked, mm -hmm. you know. She was like, like Phoebe. I mean, she wasn't married, but her diary is all about work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like she was, she didn't even become a teacher. Right. But that education was still very important. Valued, yeah. Well, I suspect that the Brooks probably didn't have the money to send her to Nine that, Partners. They wouldn't have had that much. Um, but I think at the same time, they wouldn't have dismissed the value of the education that she was getting. Um, but I, beyond that, since I don't have their perspective, I really don't know. It just may have been real practical. There's also that mm -hmm. real practical strain in the Quakers, just, you know. Mm -hmm. It made sense. You had to keep yes. accounts, right. and you had to do those sorts of things. And so you could do that. Yep. And she worked, I mean, all the time. It's really an amazing, um, it just the diary from that perspective is amazing that she spun and wove and sewed and baked and brewed and did all this stuff, and just, it's endless. And still found time to write letters and read books and take walks and I mean it's just if I didn't know better I'd say they had you know 35 hour days or something because it just seemed like she fit so much into the space of just a, of a day and when you think about the fact they're not I mean they don't have electric light and all that other stuff you know so yes any sense of why she started writing and also what the purpose of writing the diary was, at least at the outset. I know it was pretty um, Well, one of the things in the diary that's very tantalizing is when she gets to page 76, she writes, this is the second time I have covered 76 pages. So there's another diary. Oh. It may not, ha it probably hasn't survived, um, but that if you, if, I, if you look at the number of years that it takes to cover the 76 pages, it looks like she started her diary when she was probably about 14. Mm -hmm. And so it would have been a, uh, you know, a lot of young women kept diaries. And, um, and so I think that was originally, that was probably part of her, um, of the ethos of her time and, and who she was. Um, I did a search, but if it's out there, it's anonymous. And then any sense, too, about why she did it? You were saying about the uh, Quakers being, you know, keeping account of their lives and so forth. Is this about um, just recording the things that she did in terms of the work that she did, or why do you think she kept the diary? Well, I think it's more than just a record of work because she does record her feelings. She does talk about the fact when she feels like she hasn't been um, worthy enough. She at times writes um, very prayerfully. Um, at other times she's just recording how many um, hanks of yarn she spun. Still other times she writes interesting things that she read in the newspaper. Um, she records 
suicides, illegitimate births. I mean, it's just, there's an enormous amount of information there. I think this just became her place to put all of these things um, from her feelings all the way through to keeping track of what she's read and who's written letters to her and who she has to write letters to and that sort of thing. So it's all of those things. Yes, she was 61 when she died. And that was old. And that was yeah. For a, um, woman that had for a woman that had 11 children, yes. I would say she, she um, lived a fair long life. Um, her husband died the year before she did. And he was um, 63, I think. They were pretty close in age. And um, so, and, and because New York State didn't keep vital statistics until later, I don't know exactly what her, the cause of her death was. There's no, there's, there was no one to report that, um, or at least no one I've discovered yet. So her, the man she married was Samuel Eastman. Samuel Eastman Jr. Junior. Mm -hmm. Samuel Eastman Sr. Had, was actually born and grew up in Bristol, and um, I think he saw that area during the War of 1812 and then bought a tract of land through um, in the Macomb Purchase and divided it for his sons. So he, he I think, bought something like seven or 800 acres and then gave each one of his sons 100 acres or so and then kept some of it for himself. Um, the whole family, well, at least the immediate family, picked up and, and moved out there. And, um, but they did go back and forth. One of the things that, that's really clear in the diary is Going back and forth, even that far, was something that people did regularly. Um, Phoebe's first trip out, she describes it minutely, um, probably because this is such a major, I mean, it's over 100 miles, and she walked almost the entire way, um, and it was February. So there's all of these things. Um, she, she, uh, she traveled from Bristol to Ferrisburg, uh, spent the night at her father's in Ferrisburg, um, the next day, they took a wagon down to Button Bay. Um, the lake was frozen. They, although the ice was rotten in some places, and, and the horses did break through a few times, so that must have been exciting. Um, they um, came ashore on the other side near West, Westport. Um, they stopped, in, or I'm sorry, near Essex. They stopped and um, ate, and then traveled over Willsboro Mountain um, on a corduroy road and then stopped at Bosworth Tavern for the night. She described the fact that she picked over 90 fleas off herself the next day, walking along the road. Um, she would had to share her bed with three other women in the tavern. Here's another irony. Um, about 25 years ago, I lived over there. and I lived next door to Bosworth Tavern. So again, you know, it's one of these connections that keep kind of cropping up for me. But, um, the next day, after leaving Bosworth Tavern, they traveled as far as Baker's Corners, which is north of Plattsburgh. Again, spent the night. Then um, the next day, they, they traveled nearly the rest of the way. But if you think about that, that means that she walked anywhere from 25 to 30 miles in, you know, each day over Willsboro Mountain, and they crossed the Ford Way, and I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me. Um, and she writes very matter-of-factly about it. And, um, but even before she makes that trip, she was regularly traveling on foot. Sometimes she would hitch up the wagon, as she would say, but often she just walked. And she would, her grandfather's place was on Bristol Flats, and she would walk the four or five miles to uh, New Haven Mills to, to get thread at the at the spinning mill there, and um, and sometimes roving, and then she would walk from New Haven Mills to New Haven Center, which is another five or six miles, and then she'd walk from New Haven Center back to her family's farm. I mean, that's an enormous, uh, um, and she was doing it, you know, not every day, but often. And so, um, I often think that a good title for her would be Woman in Motion, because I mean, she was either working or.
doing something or walking or going someplace or coming back. It's really amazing how much mobility they really had. Um, but what I started to say is that her grandparents made at least two trips out west. Her brother did. Eventually, her older brother, Lauren, settled in Pickering, Ontario, and a group from the Bristol area settled out there, too. Um, some of those people were Quakers as well. Um, so there's a lot of mobility to see in the diary. And that's the other story, is the Western migration and um, some of the sort of beginning uh, uh, echoes of Manifest Destiny and going west. Um, her uncle David went out to the Ohio Territory, Cuyahoga County, and I heard from one of his descendants not long ago when she read my article in Vermont, Vermont History, she sent me an email and said, I think I'm related to Phoebe Orvis and this is who it is. And on the third page of the diary, I found an entry that said, got a letter from Uncle David today. He's gone to Ohio. So, you know, there's all these wonderful connections. Who knows where it'll go next?